Hi everyone, thank you for joining the Centre for Sustainable Tropical Fisheries and Aquaculture webinar, webinar series. Um, the centre is based at James Cook University and our research focus is uh, on aquaculture and general aquatic systems that produce food as well as industries and communities that utilise them. Uh, much of our research uh, is applied and it's based on collaborations with multidisciplinary researchers, government and industry. Uh, so today, I'm very happy to present Dr. Madeline Green, who is a forensic fisheries ecologist at CSIRO and the Centre for Marine Socio-Ecology at the University of Tasmania. Uh, Maddie is a JCU alumni. She completed her undergraduate and honours degree at JCU uh, before receiving her PhD from the University of Tasmania. Maddie is also the co-founder of Otlet which is an open access database helping research scientists share, source and request bio biological samples. Uh, so just before I hand over to Maddie, um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them in the Q&A uh, option at the bottom of your screen there and we will be answering those at the end. So with that, I will pass over to Maddie. Thanks, Mel. Um, thanks everyone for coming and uh, joining me here. Um, before I start, I just want to do an acknowledgement um, of country uh, where I work. So I just want to pay my respect to the traditional and original owners of the land that I work on, uh, Lutruwika or Tasmania, uh, and that's the Muanina people. Uh, and I want to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging who are uh, the custodians of this land and sea country that I'm really privileged to work on. Um, and I recognise their collective wisdom and knowledge um, of our land, coast and oceans. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge and pay respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, who are on this Zoom call too. I can't see you all, so I don't know who's on here. Um, so with that all said, um, thanks Mel for the nice intro. Um, You've done most of my work for me. So yes, I was at uh, JCU for my undergraduate. Uh, I then did the great uh, migration down to UTAS uh, and did my PhD there with uh, Will White, Sharon Appleyard, um, Sean Tracy and Jenny Ovenden. Um, and then I worked a bit for the Centre of Marine Socioecology uh, and soon to begin a new uh, project with CSIRO. So um, most of my previous work um, has been around the population genetics of elasmobranchs, so sharks and rays. Um, and this involves uh, a bunch of these species you can see on screen. So I'm mainly asking the questions of uh, where are populations uh, connected genetically um, around the Indo-Pacific. And uh, uh, some of these papers are out and some of them are still uh, being uh, being completed at the moment from my uh, PhD. Uh, I finished my PhD in 2019 um, and then I was offered a position to work with um, CMS, which is the Centre for Marine Socioecology. Uh, and, and this is really um, an interdisciplinary science group um, and, and a transdisciplinary science, so trans means um, with industry. Uh, and from an ecologist and a molecular ecologist background, uh, I was thrown into the world of interdisciplinary science, which is um, just incredibly uh, rewarding and applied, but also uh, very challenging to work across disciplines. Um, and I just wanted to highlight one of the projects that um, I was a part of and that CMS and, and that will be coming out really soon, and that's Future Seas. And so basically um, the United Nations, as, as most of you probably know, have declared, you know, um, this decade as the UN Decade of Ocean Science. Uh, and they've set some pretty lofty goals uh, for 2030 um, in how we want to be managing uh, and resourcing the ocean. Um, and so Future Seas is about saying, well, if we stopped doing any uh, science and we just use the data we had today, could we reach the goals that the UN have set and how would we do that? Mm -hmm. And so we actually went through a process of um, backcasting um, where you make a pathway of change to the goal that you want. Um, and, and as a part of the process, there was 12 great challenges um, that were defined. 
And these, you know, included things like, say, ocean literacy or biodiversity, um, the blue economy. So really big, um, big, chunky topics. And uh, each paper has about, um, has about probably 10 to 20 authors. And this is truly uh, interdisciplinary. So we have economists and philosophers and biologists and ecologists and uh, and uh, you know, psychologists are working together um, to say how do we reach these goals that the UN uh, has set for us. So these papers are under review at the moment um, and it's really exciting um, process to be a part of, so keep an eye out for it. And if there is anyone, because we are a virtual centre, if there is anyone uh, who works with people uh, and the marine space, uh, and wants to get involved, like please reach out to us. Um, we have a mailing list that, that you can join and um, you know, we have a lot of virtual events and especially with COVID happening, there's lots of ways um, you can get involved wherever you are. So um, that's a little about CMS. Um, but today uh, I'm talking about um, a, an eDNA project that we're about to begin. Um, and so I don't have results on this. This is very much the, the starting um, point of the project. And I had talked to Maddie Cooper, a, a JCU student, um, and got a bunch of eDNA advice from her. And, and she asked if I'd like to present um, the project that we're planning on, on doing. And so I said yes. But um, Jan had told me that I had 40 minutes to do that. Uh, and I do not have enough waffle uh, on this project or... Uh, um, meaty goodness in this project to provide 40 minutes. So I'm also going to talk about Otlet um, just at the end uh, to, to fill it out. So uh, for those who don't know, Otlet's a, a biological sample sharing platform and that's something that myself uh, and my co-collaborator, Lauren Meyer, we created, um, oh, I mean, we came up with the idea seven years ago. Um, but we're about three years into Otlet, so I'll, I'll be talking a bit about that too. Uh, right, let's get, I'm just going to have some a drink. Let's get cracking onto the eDNA project. Um, so our goal uh, is to reconstruct fisheries landings using eDNA. Uh, and, and this is within the Marine Monitoring and Surveillance team. Uh, and I've got to say that this is the absolute brainchild of um, Chris Wilcox, and this is his idea. Uh, he's just giving me the, the responsibility of being able to see the project uh, go through, and I'm really blessed and lucky for that. So um, this is Chris's idea. Marie, um, Denise is also in the Marine Monitoring um, Group. And then we also have some um, informal collaborators at the moment, CSIRO collaborators, and Bruce Deagle um, is a part of that, who's just moved down or not moved down, sorry, but has just got a new position at CSIRO. Um, and also Ying Yi uh, is a really great bioinformatician in eDNA. So um, she can be really helpful to the project as well. And so uh, it's probably not news to people on here that uh, global fisheries are incredibly important uh, for humans. And in uh, 2018, it's estimated that we caught about 97 million tonnes of fish globally, wild fish, um, and the majority of that is being consumed by humans. Uh, and, you know, fish consumption accounts for almost 20% of the global population's uh, intake of animal protein. Um, so at the global scale, we're really reliant on marine species as a food source. And it's also no surprise that these fishing activities, um, when they're poorly managed, um, can um, put some ecosystems at risk. So overfishing and exploitation, you know, are some big threats um, to marine life. And when a fishery can be well managed, uh, we know that there's more of a chance for ecosystem, food availability, livelihood uh, and cultural connection um, to the ocean, which can be sustained uh, over long periods. So a good understanding of a fishery and a good management uh, where possible can result in happier ecosystems and happier people. Uh, however, understanding fisheries and, and estimating these global catches um, is really difficult. So for today, I'm going to focus here on the commercial sector. Um, when I'm talking about fishing activity, I'm not talking about small scale artisanal or wreck fishing. 
Um, but as I was saying, uh, you know, estimating the global commercial catch is really bloody hard, um, but it's also really important. And so having good estimates of species catch compositions um, enables a whole bunch of analyses that can be completed for the fishery. So demographic modelling and then you can work out quotas, you know. Um, and the FAO, you know, does a good job at, at reporting global catches in the SAFIRA reports and, and the 2021's out. Um, and, and these estimates, you know, um, we know these estimates have large confidence intervals uh, and caveats that likely underreporting is happening. And that's by, you know, millions of tonnes. And underreporting that's in the form of, say, IUU, so that's, you know, illegal, unregulated and unreported activity um, is a really big deal. Uh, and it even has its own subsection under the Sustainable Development Goals, under Life Underwater. So globally, it's a priority to reduce um, IUU fishing. Uh, and nations are actually measured on how well um, they're combating IUU fishing. Now, underreporting can happen for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, you know, it's not just that fishermen are doing the wrong thing. There's, there's a really wide array of reasons. And, and some of these could include um, no capacity of a nation to enforce or report um, compliance. So there's maybe no um, money or capacity available to build an AFMA like we have here in Australia. Um, you know, it may not be a priority for some nations to be able to manage their fisheries. They may have bigger problems uh, and they may not have political will as well. Um, there might not be social norms pressuring other, say, fisher folk to report accurately. Um, fishers may not understand the rules uh, and report inaccurately in fear of getting in trouble. Uh, and of course, if illegal fishing, you know, might be occurring, then you're definitely not going to be reporting that. Um, but we also know um, that on some vessels, um, some vessels will catch species um, and then sometimes discard these if more high value fish are caught and they need more room in the hold. So although these animals were caught and killed, um, they won't actually be reported in the total catch uh, when a boat docks. And we do have some really great ways of how we monitor fisheries at the moment. Um, we have logbooks where, you know, fishers keep a record of what was caught, discarded, bycatch, um, and this often includes fishing effort as well. Uh, we have observers, which are a great way to find out what's being caught and monitor the conditions on a boat. Um, and electronic monitoring is becoming more and more popular uh, with cameras and GPSs and all new tech tools uh, on, these, on these ships. Um, however, you know, logbooks can be lost at sea or incorrectly filled out or damaged. Um, observer coverage um, is pretty low across fisheries. Uh, and in some cases, it's really dangerous to be an observer on a boat. Um, and there are cases of where observers have gone missing. Um, and so it, you know, um, it's, it's just, it's quite dangerous sometimes to be an observer. Um, and electronic monitoring is a really good method um, that's being implemented by a number of fisheries. But um, some nations, you know, as we're talking about capacity, um, might not have the money to spend on this technology or the boats aren't sophisticated enough um, to have that kind of tech on board. So you can see that there's a need um, for more tools um, to help measure and monitor commercial catch, um, which can help us better understand fisheries in general. Uh, and so the new project I'm a part of is uh, trying to do just that. And we want to create a new tool to put in the toolbox uh, for monitoring and estimating fisheries landings. And so this involves collecting eDNA from boats to reconstruct the species that have been caught uh, during that fishing trip. And so eDNA, um, I'm sure there's a lot of geneticists on here uh, listening, but I'll go through it for those who aren't. Um, eDNA is increasingly being used uh, in research science for a range of questions like biodiversity and invasive species monitoring. Uh, and this is in all sorts of environments, freshwater, marine, soils, I think air, you can collect eDNA maybe. Um, and, and so basically by collecting samples, you can extract DNA uh, and then you can uh, sequence this and identify if a species uh, has been uh, present in that area. 
Uh, so the project, uh, we're currently uh, in the process of finding boats in Australia to trial this method. Uh, and this is due to COVID and travel restrictions, but it's also because Australia has some really well-managed, well-documented fisheries uh, where log books are maintained. So uh, we want to trial this on fisheries where we can compare and validate our results with what was actually caught. Uh, we're in conversation with some longliner boats in the tuna fishery in Mooloolaba, um, but I'm also on the lookout for other boats with fish holds and brine uh, who might be willing to let us take some water samples. And so what we're proposing to do is sample the fish hold of a boat for eDNA. So in some longline and trawl fisheries, um, you have vessels with these really large cavities here in the orange box um, that's called a fish hold. And so, all, um, and so in here we have really salty water that's called a brine and it's kept really cold, often below zero. And all the fish um, are dumped into the brine. They're not sorted, they're not binned, they're not separated. Uh, and we end up having this huge tank of icy brine with lots of dead fish hanging around and of course uh, shedding lots of DNA. And so different fish uh, can be processed differently uh, with some being beheaded or gutted. Um, and other fish will be dumped in whole into the brine. And these boats can be out at sea from anywhere between two to three weeks. Uh, sorry, two weeks to three months, uh, depending on some places. And uh, the fish are being held in, the, held in the brine that whole time. So what we want to do is collect some of this brine when the ship docks to offload its product. Uh, and we want to see if we can reconstruct the landings uh, which stored uh, the fish uh, which was, sorry, stored, um, the landings which were stored in the fish hold during that fishing trip. How are we going to do it? Uh, this is a very simple schematic of how we're going to do this. Um, but basically, um, it's important that we want to scale this technology, and so I want to keep it as low tech as possible. Um, but because this is a new technique, I also want to see what the difference is between the two main kinds of eDNA collection um, and see if one is better than the other. Um, so this means I'll be trialling a precipitation method. So I'm going to put the um, water directly into a buffer, which is going to bind and preserve the eDNA, similar um, to some experiments that were ran in Renshaw uh, 2015. Uh, and then I also want to try a filtration method. And this is where we collect a large amount of water and filter using a very large pore size, uh, obviously, given there's going to be a fair bit of goop coming out of that um, fish hold brine. So I'm going to say goop a lot, but what I mean by goop is that um, if you imagine lots of dead fish floating in water, there's going to be big bits of um, fins and blood and mucus and I don't know, all sorts of things. So which is being called goop for the rest of this talk. Um, so preferably I'd like uh, the buffer to work, so I'd like the precipitation method to work um, because the more equipment we have if we're going to filter, um, the more opportunities we provide for contamination and, and I really do want this to keep this low tech and to keep it easy for non-specialists to be able to take these sorts of samples. And so after collection, um, we're then going to try and identify species using a meta barcoding approach. This is a really simplified schematic because I don't think genetics should be complicated for all of us. Um, but basically we'll, um, uh, we'll use fish and shark um, specific primers to amplify the DNA. And then we're going to sequence these amplifications uh, and then we're going to match some of these sequences with known species sequences on BOLD or GenBank. Um, so we will be doing meta barcoding and not qPCR, um, given that we've got an assemblage or a bunch of animals that we're species that we're looking at. And so once we have our species IDs, which I hope we get, I understand that with eDNA you don't always get down the species level. Um, but hopefully if we can get down the species level, we can then go back to the logbook information and um, and we can you know compare the pair. So we want to see if the species landed um, in the, and written in the logbook match with the species genetically identified um, from the eDNA. And so we plan on having about 10-ish trips um, and each of these have a stratified sampling approach to account for replicates and controls, but I didn't want to add that in there because it's a bit boring. Now, another part um, of this validation project 
uh, is to see if we can estimate the relative abundance of species in the fish hold. Now, abundance estimates using eDNA are still very tricky and difficult to achieve, I know. Uh, however, I think that we have a kind of unique opportunity um, with our project, given we're working in a closed system, which is that fish hold. Um, and in the literature, um, it seems um, that laboratory experiments have been able to measure abundances kind of accurately. So I think there is a bit of hope for this. Uh, and I'm thinking we're probably going to use the sequencing read depth or meta barcoding outputs um, and look at the proportions between species. So looking for a relative abundance. Um, and we want to see if that obviously correlates with our known catch in logbooks. Uh, and so this is still to be worked out and determined, but I, I hope we can do it. Um, and ultimately, you know, we're going to have to build out a better function um, and we can use this kind of information into the source function. So that would be the meta barcoding information, the size of the fish hold. We can look at the amount of brine that was in the boat, um, the type of processing that will change the shedding rates. Um, and also what changes the shedding rates of DNA is the size and length um, and how many fish are going to be in there. So all those sorts of things will be moved into a big source function and we'll make something work from that. Uh, and, and, you know, this is a unique eDNA project. Um, so it means it comes, it, it doesn't come with the same common issues that eDNA researchers um, face. So I actually have an abundance of eDNA and goopy material in these fish holds. Um, the brine slurry is maintained at a really cold temperature. So this is going to help preserve the DNA. Um, and we also are starting in this validation phase, you know, we know the size of the fish hold, we know the amount of brine that's been put in there, and we know the species that we're actually looking for. But each of these factors, you know, have positive and negative aspects, um, and that's going to make this project easier and harder in some ways. So uh, too much DNA is a wonderful problem to have, but are these goopy bits going to clog my filters? Uh, are they going to create some bias in our PCR? Um, protocols and so that's something I need to keep an eye out on uh, and something else I need to consider is uh, where is the water and the ice um, that goes into the brine slurry initially from and is this a source of contamination and so from my conversations with fishers and, and fleet operation managers it seems that the brine and the ice come from different sources depending on the capacity of the vessel so it's something that I'm probably is going to change over time depending on the vessels that we sample to. Uh, the, the project itself has really two phases. So the first is to validate the method and check these results with a well-maintained logbook. Uh, and if phase one is successful, we can identify all of the majority of species that are caught. Uh, then we can move on to phase two, where the hauls and the landings are largely unknown uh, and we collect water samples from the fish holds. And so we're going to try and work with um, some partners in WWF in Pakistan, some trawl boats um, coming off the Arabian Gulf. But, um, you know, I'm also on the lookout for other commercial fishers uh, in low reporting regions to, to test our method. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk with anyone who has any ideas about that. Uh, and I have some big, you know, we have some big long-term goals for this project too. So, you know, scaling this tool to be applicable across a number of fisheries and regions uh, is going to be pretty exciting. Um, and the optimization part of that meta barcoding is going to be pretty tricky, I acknowledge. And training fisheries officers uh, to take this, you know, to take samples um, on the docks is going to be super interesting. And, and I hope we'll be able to do that. Uh, and also, you know, trialling some new technology, which is coming from a few other CSIRO projects and FSP projects, um, one of which, you know, includes a passive eDNA collection. Um, and so other, you know, user-friendly, non-specialist tools to help um, them be able to, to collect these samples. And, you know, ultimately, I think there are some really wonderful benefits of this project that has some really exciting capacity um, to be able to help provide another tool for the manager's toolbox uh, to estimate fisheries landings. And, you know, no tool is a silver bullet and I don't think this is going to save the world and uh, we're not going to eDNA every fish hold. Uh, but I do think there's some really great outputs if the project is successful. 
So, you know, firstly, um, we're going to help improve local and global catch estimates. Uh, and we can start to look at what fish are being caught, which is really one of the first steps before any demographic modelling can be complete for the fishery. Uh, and it gets us closer to understanding, you know, if that food source and that livelihood is sustainable in the region. Uh, the second is it removes the need possibly um, for or reduces the number of observers on board, um, you know, and if we can save people from going missing at sea because they're an observer, then that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, you know, another benefit is that it, if we can keep it low tech, um, that's going to be super easy to train non-specialists how to do this. Um, another thing I'm really interested in is, um, and we've only just sort of talked about this in the last few days, but um, another potential output um, is working with a group down here who are currently estimating the nutritional output of certain fisheries um, to see if people are receiving the essential nutrients they need uh, from fish um, in their diets. Uh, and this was a paper published by Hicks et al, a bunch of people last year. Uh, and in order for the group to start doing some more fine scale and local estimates of nutritional values, um, they need to know the species catch composition a bit better in the region. So this tool can sort of be, you know, a stepping stone for understanding um, the catch composition and then um, having a look at that kind of food for all that planetary health side of things. Uh, and, you know, the last one, I think a way that this might help too, is that as we see more species undertake range shifts due to a changing climate, um, it's possible that this eDNA monitoring might be able to provide another source of early detection or just general information for how um, fisheries catch landings are changing. Are we seeing new species? Are we seeing an abundance um, changes? Are we seeing changes in ratios of species? So, the project really is about creating a tool um, which will help us understand fisheries in areas which are maybe difficult to measure, report or get access to. Um, and it means that we can understand, you know, how at risk ecosystems and people are who rely heavily on fisheries. Um, and, and personally, um, I want this tool to be more than just a possible idea for enforcement or monitoring. Um, I really see the role of this project is to provide a tool which generates information and that information can be taken up by a variety of disciplines. So to assess livelihoods, to assess fisheries, to assess socioeconomic values, really, and, and strive for, you know, long-term sustainability and, and human rights in places as well. And so that is, is basically um, the, the project and what we hope to do. Um, I'll get back to you in a few years with how we go, um, but I will gladly take some questions after this, um, after the next bit um, on, on the project. And if people would like to get in contact and um, about it, please do. I, you know, it's, it's pretty rare that you get an opportunity to present the start of a project and get feedback on that. So I'd be really keen to get some feedback from anyone and everyone. Okay, I'm going to um, change up, uh, change lanes, change gears, uh, and we're going to start talking about Outlet. Um, so my friend Lauren and I, about seven years ago, decided to start a little database called Shark Share. And I think JCU was actually one of the first early adopters of Shark Share. Um, and then what happened was he had, so it was basically helping shark scientists find other shark scientists who had shark samples. Uh, and we had a whole lot of other scientists ask us um, if we could make databases for them for different taxa, different species. So uh, Lauren and I started working on that plan uh, and we received some investment. Uh, and before we knew it, we kind of uh, fell into um, an entrepreneurial world uh, and were owning a tech startup in the middle of our PhDs. So um, it was a pretty wild time and I wouldn't recommend anyone start a company while they're doing their PhD, but um, it, it's, it's an incredible thing and I'm really proud of, of where Otlet's at. So I just wanted to share um, for people who haven't seen it before what Otlet is. Uh, but also talk about um, some new features that are coming out really soon. Um, 
So basically, we've created Otlet um, to encourage and promote more responsible use of biological samples. Uh, I think all scientists can do better at using, reusing and sharing biological samples. So we decided to make a platform to help us all do that. Uh, and this will look familiar to most of you out in the field, collecting samples, jabbing animals, it's what we do. Uh, and then we take all these samples and we store them in our freezers. And I'm sure that heaps of us um, have a freezer full of things we don't know or we're not sure, we probably could share to someone, but or, or I don't want to look at it, it's too difficult. Um, so we're all a bit guilty, me too, um, for having lots of leftover samples. And there are huge sampling opportunities that are missed. Uh, that means there's huge scientific opportunities that are missed. Um, and so um, we need to get better at sharing. Um, and we have some collaborative infrastructure to do that. Uh, ResearchGate is getting more sophisticated by the minute. Um, LinkedIn, I guess we don't really use that. Um, but emails as well is a really good way. Um, but you know, when Lauren and I were at the start of this journey, we realized that a lot of people, um, even still through emails, it still wasn't enough and, and opportunities were being missed. So we decided to, to make the database. So how all that works uh, is kind of um, three, three parts. So the first is that you can search um, for plant and animal species. Um, so samples, sorry, um, the people have uploaded. Uh, you can share, so you can upload your own samples um, that you have spare that you're happy to collaborate with. Uh, and you can also request samples that aren't available. So in the early days of Otlet, when we didn't have many samples, people were like, oh, I'm looking for, it's a bit like Gumtree where you can say, I'm looking for a couch. You could say, I'm looking for some frog samples. Uh, and that still exists on the database. So you could go through, even if you don't, want to take the time to put your samples up. Uh, you can go through the list and say, oh, I have those samples, I could help that person out. And ultimately, this is helping us all collaborate uh, and work with each other, you know, and I think there are incredible things that come out of um, collaborations and conversations with lots of different people and sharing samples and big projects. So um, it's nice that Otlet's able to facilitate some of that. Uh, we have a bunch of people using Otlet. Uh, we have people from universities, from museums, uh, governments, NGOs, uh, and research institutes too. Uh, we even have a group uh, called Wreckfish West. So they go to wreck fishing competitions. And I think they must do a bit of kind of, it's sort of like citizen science, I guess, but they're uh, taking measurements and they take a bunch of samples at these wreck fishing competitions uh, from the, the samples and they put them all up on Otlet. So there's heaps of samples from, from there as well, which is a really unique. Um, place to get samples for science, which I love. Uh, and, and given your JCU, uh, I think on your ethics forms, actually, Otlet might be, you might be promoted or asked to use Otlet. So a lot of the ethics committees around Australia and New Zealand um, are really interested in Otlet, given that we promote the three R's, which I think are, you know, reuse or rethink or re... Anyway, it's about responsible use. Um, and uh, and so ethics committees really like Otlet and so they promote you. Um, I will ask that if, if you are say sacrificing a whole animal, can, are there some samples or spare samples that can be put on Otlet? And I, I fully support that, obviously. Uh, and I don't often get enough time in talks um, to talk about why we're called Otlet. And so I'm actually gonna take five minutes to do that. Um, but basically, this is Paul Otley, and he was a Belgian scientist. He was a physicist, poet, philosopher, you know, and they were one of everything. Uh, and he is really incredible. Um, so basically, he came up, well, what he loved doing was, was categorising knowledge, right? And, and he came up with sort of early ideas of Dewey Decimal Systems, um, which then got superseded by what we have now. Um, but he, he believed that if you could categorise and store the world's knowledge and make it accessible, that that's, really, that's a really powerful thing. Uh, and he actually pretty much came up with the idea of what the, in how the internet stores information now. Um, and he was so ahead of his time and it was incredible. And he actually had um, these index cards and with bits of information and people could write in and, um, 
and ask him a question, just like on a Google search, uh, and he would send them back this index card of information. And this was all in the mail though, so it took a long time. Um, but he ended up having like 2.3 million index cards of knowledge and information. And the Mondemayum is, is still a museum that uh, his workspace still exists there now today. Uh, and so Lauren and I, in a total homage to Paul Utley, um, believe that, you know, samples, when we run analyses on them, unlock knowledge about the ecosystems and about the species we work on. And if we're sharing samples, then we're sharing knowledge. And that's a really wonderful thing. So that's um, just a little background to why we're called uh, Utlet. Uh, and so what's on our database at the moment? Uh, last I checked, we've got, I think over 21,000 samples and that's across plants and animals. Um, and if a deal comes through very soon, we'll have a few million on there, but um, we'll just see how we go with that. Uh, at the moment that's contributed by, so these 21,000 samples, about 600 scientists. Uh, and this is from truly from around the world. So we have people in 50, you know, more than 50 different countries, which is amazing for us. Uh, this is a very old list, um, so it needs updating, but uh, these are just some of the people or the, the you know, teams of people who are using Otlet and where they're from. Uh, you can see that JCU is there. They were our early adopters, I think. Uh, these are some common questions we get. Uh, it's free. So you, there's no paywall. There's no subscription. Um, Lauren and I have worked very hard. I don't believe in, well, I believe in open access things for scientists, right? Um, so we've worked very hard to keep it free for everyone. Um, it's not just for uh, marine animals. It's for any um, plants and animals. Uh, I'm a really big fan of transparency when it comes to sample agreements and sample sharing. So we make sure that when you submit samples, you very clearly say what, um, what a level of acknowledgement you're looking for for those um, samples. Uh, and also um, you can talk about who's gonna cover transport. Uh, and the last one is we're not Amazon, we're not storing your samples. Uh, you can store them as well. So um, there's some benefits here. Um, there are, you know, creating global collaborations and projects. I think that's really exciting. Um, enabling ECRs and students. Right now on Otlet, there are so many projects you could make with the samples that are available. And given COVID um, is stopping, you know, a lot of our field work, I think that's an incredible resource. And we're seeing an increase in that being used. And given that honours projects don't often have much time, if you can save that field work and get an honours done just from the samples that are on Otlet, what an incredible thing, right? Uh, and naturally, if you're not going out in the field, then you're saving a lot of money too. Um, some other benefits helps you track uh, your samples once you've got them on there and gone through that process of going through your freezer. Um, and, and it really is promoting a more responsible use of samples, which is what I'm all about. A couple of pilot programs that we have coming up at the moment. So we've had people ask us for additional features on Otlet. Uh, and these are things like um, having team lab groups um, and having yearly reporting and stuff. And that's all wonderful. And I would love to do that for free, but we can't. So we have, uh, you know, it costs money to build these sorts of things. So we have institutional accounts um, that we're piloting at the moment. Um, and it allows for things like groups and teams to work together and have samples together. And it also means you can succession plan. So when someone leaves, which happens often, what happens to their samples that are left over in those freezers? and who's in charge of them and so we have a bit of a system to help someone shift all their samples and assign them to someone else. We're also going to be opening a outlet shipping service which is pretty fun. Um, permitting and shipping I know is one of the most painful parts of moving samples around and so we're going to be um, providing some support on that and we have a logistics um, person, a person in logistics, uh, and we're getting a transport account so I hope we can get cheaper, um, cheaper parcels so you know it's cheaper to send these samples around because sometimes it could be super expensive. Um, so if you're interested in either of those please send us an email. Um, and then the last thing is during 
you know, when coronavirus happened, I realized that a lot of people were losing a field season um, and, and there were going to be lots of students who maybe were relying on being able to get out to finish their theses, to finish their studies, whatever. Uh, and so I decided that there's a lot of researchers and myself included with spare data that, you know, could be given to a student in need. So we've started a, a data sort of matchmaking service um, and it's for, you know, students in need of data sets and it's for researchers who have spare or available data sets. Uh, and it really is open to um, all disciplines as well. So we have a Google form. There's been a few matches we've been able to make for students, which is amazing. And we've had so much interest and so many senior researchers provide or offer up um, data sets that I'm just, I'm really um, surprised and, and super um, grateful for the scientific community for really getting on board with that. And, and we even had some articles out about it. So um, that's still growing. And if you do have available data, please let me know or register and I can pass on these slides if anyone wants. Um, so please contact Otlet if you want about any of this or contact me. Um, and I think that's the end. So um, thanks so much for listening and sticking around. Um, Mel, are there any questions? Yeah, thanks so much, Maddie, for a great talk, um, both about what you're going to be doing and also what you have done and continue to do with Otlet. There is a few questions here. Yeah. Um, so let's just go through those. Um, so one of the questions is, is the hold in the, uh, the fishing boats, is it cleaned out between trips? Yeah. Um, and will it matter? Will this matter or not? Yeah. Um, so that's the first one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and it's a good question and it's something we're thinking about. Um, it seems like they do get a clean. From what I've heard, they do get a clean before they head out again, how good that clean is and whether that clean is, you know, um, a, at a level that's going to mean not contamination for the next trip, we're not sure. Um, but I think because there's so much DNA coming off the animals um, that are in the hold in the next trip, we should be okay. Um, but it's something that we've got to test and we've got to see. So we'll set up some controls and doing a before and after kind of test too. So before they leave, um, are we picking up anything in the hold, you know? Um, so yeah, that's a part of the design and it's something we're thinking about. Yeah. Awesome. That actually uh, answers two of the other questions. Um, yeah. Just aside to that is, would you expect degradation rates of different species to be different over time? Ooh. Ooh, look, my background in is in population genetics uh, and I'm very new to eDNA. But from what I've read, uh, I think, you know, DNA degrades differently for all sorts of reasons and maybe at a different species level. Um, and it's a good thought and it's something that I should think about. If anyone else on here knows that answer, that would be great if they could write that in. Um, or if they know the paper. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually a question by Jan, so she's probably um, one of the people to to talk to about this. Yeah, Jan probably stuff knows as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it was Jan. Might not be, but um, okay. if there is anyone, it yeah. might be Jan to. It might be good to follow up there. Okay. Um, yeah. So we've got a question from Mick Grant, who has uh, been watching, um, and he has said, "I'm just." Uh, Quickly summarising. So, yep. uh, in regards to non-target catch, which often does not make it into the fish hold, is there any interest in also swabbing, say, deck goop to uh, assess assess uh, species diversity that doesn't reach the fish fish <laughs> the fish hold? Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. I've been oh, I've been thinking about this. I think it's later down the track because there's so much contamination, right? How how are you going to be able to control for knowing what you're looking at? It's very forensic at that point um, when you're starting to sort of swab at that level. Um, I think it's something I've thought about and I think it's something I'd like to keep uh, in my mind, but not something we're going to do at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that would apply possibly to doing instead of the tuna long lines. Um, it would be something you could do with that possibly in the future. Maybe. Uh, outside of the tuna long lines we say? Yeah. No, with the, just with, um, so 
the example of shark bycatch in tuna long lines that would just be discarded on overboard rather yeah. than in the yeah. hold space itself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which is what you did kind of answer. Sorry. I'm just yeah. trying to. No, no. All good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we actually have a response to uh, the question that was initially asked about the degradation. Um, it would probably occur across species, but at a low rate in icy water. So great. There's an answer there. Um, <laughs> is there any other questions that people want to uh, ask while we have Maddie here? Um, I'll just give it a couple of seconds, but um, no, I, think, I think um, that's probably about it. So um, I guess, yeah, with that, thank you so much for taking the time to um, okay. present this afternoon and thank you to everyone. Uh, actually, where is the best to contact you? That is on the screen. Um, yes. And this video will be recorded and made live on YouTube as well. So um, for those that haven't been able to uh, attend tonight or this evening, you should be able to um, view it there. So with that, thank you so much, Maddie. Thank and, you. Um, yeah, alrighty, bye. Thanks, bye.